Hey everyone, you're about to watch an episode of The Covenant Cast featuring Travis, Paul, and Steve, some very special guests here at the Gamma Trade Show 2019. And while we're recording this, our primary source of audio actually failed. So we're having to use the secondary backup source. And it's not quite the quality you probably come to expect from The Covenant Cast, but this podcast was good enough that we wanted to publish it anyway. So sit back and enjoy, and we appreciate you listening. Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Covenant Cast. I'm Zach. I'm Steve. I'm Paul. And I'm Travis. And today I'm joined at Gamma 2019 by some very special guests. These are all retailers in the tabletop games industry. So this is the state of retail cash. We're going to run it down the state and future of retail. So stay tuned and we'll catch you on the other side of the intro. Let's, let's do this. So the first thing I want to know is who are you, which you already you said your name in the intro, which is fine. Uh, but where is your store located and what makes your store unique? Okay. So I'm Steve again. I own a, a Rainy Day Games. We celebrated our 20th anniversary last year. Wow. We're have on. you owned it the whole time? Yes. That's yeah. awesome. Myself and my business partner, Jeff, have owned it since day one. Um, it's on the west, west side of Portland, Oregon. Okay. So kind of the western suburbs. And uh, we've only moved once the whole time. So we've been in the last location since 2001. So wow, been there a while. I'd say what makes us unique is that we really focus on kind of customer service and making our sales floor interactive. So we've got 11 demo tables and those rotate fairly often. And my staff knows how to teach those games. So Very cool. people can come in and get an experience even without buying something. But sure. it's hard to buy, hard not to buy when you've had a good time playing something. So, so they can see it, they can feel it, they can yeah. touch it, see what's going on, they can learn it. Yeah. So there's a big advantage there that we have over, you know, say an Amazon or something like that, right? Is you get to experience it and ask people questions about it. Sure. Okay. Cool. So uh, I'm Paul, and I've I own games and stuff uh, in Glen Burnie, Maryland. We're right near BWI Airport, just south of Baltimore. Um, what makes my store unique? Um, so actually, much like Steve's, the, the sales floor has become very, um, uh, very interactive. I've got multiple game tables uh, and where people can touch and play with stuff. Um, but I think what, what really makes us special these days is, is whether you're into miniatures or role-playing games or board games or whatever, like you feel like we're a store that specializes in that. So we've got depth and breadth of catalog in each of what I call the four quadrants, with the fourth one being you know collectible card games. Um, so you, you feel like we're, we're, we're very much... Uh, uh, you know, a directed miniature store. I'm sorry. A, you're like a miniature store. Yeah, it feels like oh, we're a miniature store. But in fact, like a board gamer is going to feel like oh, we're a board gamer store too. Um, that being said, I mean miniatures is the biggest part of what we do. We're about five minutes away from where GW's U.S. headquarters used to be for mm -hmm. many years. Um, so I have like a, a paint station on the sales floor. Where people can just hang out and paint and stuff. Um, but yeah, I feel like we're we're um, no matter what kind of game nerd you are, you're going to feel like this is a special place for you. Cool. What about you, Travis? I'm Travis. I own uh, Millennium Games in Rochester, New York, with my business partner, Rob. Um, what makes us unique? We're 11,000 square feet. Hmm. Uh, so that's a pretty big boat that we get to play around with. Um, we focus on events a lot. We, our, our floor can fit. We had a 218-person Yu-Gi-Oh! regional a couple of weeks ago, so that's pretty wow. good. And that didn't even count the private room space that we have. Um, what would I say that... It, so I had a, a publisher friend that came in and visited the store over the weekend um, who was going to a Pokemon Regional in Toronto. And he said it was really nice to walk into a game store and feel like it didn't, wasn't somebody's bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, That's a great quote. we tend to block the trend of what typically people think of when they think about what a standard game store would look like. So we very much sort of take a big box approach when it comes to retailing and have pretty wide offers and you know, we go out in some crazy areas sometimes and stuff, but make sure that everybody kind of feels like they have their own home too. So I would say, yeah, the size and the scale of what we do is not typical of what you see in the industry for sure. Very cool. Um, okay, so my first question for you guys is, why Why did you get into the tabletop game retail business? Uh, I'm really curious to know, like, the driving force behind that. Oh, man. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll start it off with... Huh? So I was an engineer in high tech before. <clears throat> okay. So uh, my business partner and I both met. We met playing Magic, okay, at local tournaments and things sure. like that. The store we played at was closing, and we thought, jokingly, oh, we should just buy this place. We're like, <laughs> oh, maybe we should. And then we looked at it and we talked to the owners, and it's like, oh, this is an awful business. Like, <laughs> we don't want this. Like, we don't want this at all. 
And then we joked around some more and thought, maybe we should just open our own from scratch. And like a couple silly young guys, we decided How to How old were you at the time? So we were in our late 20s. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so we just decided to do it. And it's like, how much money are you willing to lose? It's like, well, I'm willing to lose X. I could lose X. <laughs> and, and, you know, and we're like, let's, let's try this, right? And so neither one of us had worked a retail day in our lives. That's um, awesome. Uh, so it's just kind of crazy. Basically just a passion for gaming. Yeah. That we were like, this, this would be really cool. I think the community needs it. You know, so we opened a store and we opened our store in 98. So six months later, Pokemon hit. So we were you know, marketing geniuses. <laughs> um, <laughs> Things went well for you. Yeah. It's so like you're the one game store in town. And this is Portland? Portland, yeah, the west side of Portland. So there's still a lot of game stores. Portland has, I think, more game stores than almost any city in the country. Um, and that's still the case. There's, but the one you were going to, it shut down. The one we were going to was shutting down. So we started started our own. And Man. It went from there. If they'd just gone six more months, they could have had the Pokemon we, glory. We went, yeah. So we started it on my business partner's sabbatical from one of his okay. tech, tech jobs. And then uh, about a year into it, I left my tech job and have been full-time ever since. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. No looking back. That's right. What about you? So my, I'm almost a bit of a polar opposite to Steve, I guess. Yeah. So my store has been around for 19 years. Um, I've been operating it since 2010, but I've only owned it outright for about two years. Um, so I spent the entire of, entirety of my adult life running specialty retail stores. So I came from retail. I got my start in the music industry and back when record stores were a thing. From there, I sold fashion clothing. I worked for Hot Topic for a bajillion years. Um, I, 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 I did all, everything you can imagine as part of a regional uh, uh, retail chain. So when I moved back to Baltimore, my hometown, a friend of mine that owned the store needed a board game nerd on staff. And I happened to be that guy. And yeah. I was like, oh, I can help you run some board game events or make sure you've got you know, an appropriate you know, uh, mix of product. And it was, you know, right around the time when board games were really starting to explode. So I came in to help out with that. A year later, he had cause to get rid of the old manager, asked me to take over. I took over, at which point I started rearranging everything because I came from corporate retail. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, you know, let's, this needs to be a, a different kind of store, you know, and not the perfectly functional sort of, you know, traditional game and card shop that it was, but it was not what my expectations were for a, for a profitable business. So I just started making some fairly drastic changes. And it was only a couple years later we moved into our current location. Um, and you know, as the, the old owner sort of stepped further and further back, I eventually just bought it from him. Sure. So I so I came from retail, but having been a gamer since the late 70s, it was just a passion of mine. So it's this perfect merging of of a passion and a skill set. Sure. So I, I want to ask a question off of that really quick, uh, which is if you came from retail and you changed everything up, what do you think is one thing that you changed that had a drastic impact that you see a lot of other tabletop game stores uh, doing like the, the store you're at used to do or doing wrong? Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's almost, it, it's customer service and merchandising. Okay. Yeah, it, it's customer service and merchandising. Like um, we've all been in that game store where it's like the Simpsons comic book guy where he just wants, you know, the personal and staff just wants to talk about what it is that they like and why the thing that you like sucks. Um, Obviously, that that's never an experience somebody wants to have. Um, there's too many. There's still too many game stores that feel like boys clubs, that in, in you know that are, that aren't welcoming environments for for women or families, and that has to change. Um, and then merchandising. I mean, you know, you can't just throw some stuff on a shelf and and hope for the best. Like there are there there are there are techniques and the skill set out there um, to allow merchandising to you know better feature and sell your products for you. Sure. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Travis? So I came from finance. Um, I was doing mortgages and selling money got real boring. And I started working part-time for the store that I own now. Um, the store has been in the plaza that I'm in now for about 36 years. It's gone under two wow. ownership changes and, and it one name change. And I started working for the guy that I eventually bought the business from uh, part-time. And then I moved into a full-time position and... Um, started to kind of learn the inner workings of the business. And the guy was, the guy that owned the place before was enthusiastic about the game industry, but less enthusiastic about caring about running day-to-day -day business operations stuff. So um, I kind of got the store back where it was, was in good shape. And um, my business partner that I have now, him being an RIT graduate and uh, being somebody that's more familiar with kind of the digital space, intelligently looked at our plaza and said, oh, there's a whole bunch of game nerds that are there. Awesome. 
two doors over was an open space. And he said, let me open a land center here. <laughs> These guys that like tabletop stuff probably like digital stuff as well. Um, so he moved in and I got to know him pretty well. And we would have kind of daily discussions about different things and expansion opportunities. And him and I philosophically agreed on a lot of things. We had good integrity with each other and stuff. And I, I, I think when we made the proposal to buy the business, we had probably known each other for five months. Um, this was going to be a pretty significant ask. And, you know, he wasn't fully confident with everything that was going on on my side of things. And I knew his numbers pretty well because he was much more of a measurement type guy, uh, very logical decision making process and stuff. So um, I started showing him some numbers and some opportunities and ways that we could make it better. And then slowly but surely, we got to the point where we agreed on a price. And, you know, the rest is kind of history. That was 10 years ago now. So we moved the, the main body of our store, which was kind of a dilapidated hole, into his space because he came from a construction background, which was super helpful too. Um, built out a really nice retail location. We took on some more of the space that was used for warehousing and kind of converted that into our nice play space. And after a couple of years of being there, we bought in another location that was part of the plaza. So we added an additional 3,000 square foot of space that ended up being mostly back end stuff, but our private game center ended up coming out of there as well. So um, it just kind of slowly, we, we built up this this good amount of momentum and just kind of rode it out. Um, the both of us are pretty good about looking at decisions and saying, we will toss it out around an idea, a new idea around, and we'll kick it around and we'll beat on it, both of us, for a good long time. And then we make a decision on it and we're just going to go. And we're 120 miles an hour in that direction. That's not to say that we haven't failed when we've done that, but we want to fail for a reason and okay. we want it to be a big failure. You fail fast. Rather than not momentum and not pushing it and not doing the stuff that we needed to do. So yeah. uh, it's comforting to do that. Like we we each take our bruises at the same pace that way. We both have our successes at the same at the same time too. So it's a it's a it's a good feeling to have that. I'm kind of more of a gut guy and he's more of a numbers guy. So the two of us work well based off of that. So. Nice. Um, so let's get into this is a big question to ask, and I don't know that any one of you are going to be able to answer it, but essentially I'm kind of wanting to define the landscape of tabletop retail. And it's hard to get into that without a very long conversation about the history and how we got here. Sure. Um, but I, I think over the past five to 10 years specifically, there have been significant changes in <clears throat> what it means to be a tabletop gaming retailer. Because um, I remember when I was a kid, I used to, I came from a small town. We didn't have a game store. Um, so me and Steven, one of the, the guys here, right, normally on the show, uh, we'd go up to Tulsa, which is like an hour away, and go to the game stores and play tournaments and stuff. Um, but, you know, back in the, the 90s when Pokemon first came out, right, I, I get a sense that, you know, Steve, your store is more of kind of a traditional retail uh, establishment, maybe not as focused on the giant play space of Travis yeah. and stuff. Um, but... It was mostly that, right? It was like they bought gaming products. They had them on the shelves. My mom would take me there. We'd buy 10 packs of Pokemon. We'd leave. And that was kind of it. We'd sometimes play. They had some tables. But then every time magic was happening, we'd get kicked off those tables because that was the thing that was going on. Um, but back then, right, it just felt, uh, I would almost say, like simpler. Where it's like I, I think a lot more people could get by on shelves with whatever new products are coming out on them. This is the place you get it. So what do you think are the... From that moment, I think the simplicity of the early 90s, maybe, to now. You have so, I mean, well, the internet happened, yeah. right? Sure. I mean, the internet it's happened. And at some point, like, if I'm going to be just a collection of products on shelves, there will always be somebody online who has a better selection than me who can probably undercut my price. Sure. So I need to become an, an experienced retailer. You know, it's, it's about the experience that you have in my store. And, of course, part of that is, you know, the knowledge that my staff brings and the fact that, you know, we can have meaningful conversations. But sometimes those meaningful conversations mean getting into really crazy esoterica, like when the guy wants to talk about his tenth level paladin. Like, you know, you know like, they, like it, it, well, <laughs> right. It needs to feel like a, a, a you know, a space where, where people can sort of engage in their passions with other like-minded folks. Um, so that's part of the puzzle. The other piece, of course, is, is the events. Like it needs it, you know, so much, so many of, of the game stores in, in the last, you know, six or eight years have transitioned into um, places with, with play space. I mean, much like yourself, I remember when game stores yeah. had no play space. You know, there might be a dirty table in the back where somebody was painting something, maybe, yeah. you know. Um, but now, like, it's hard to exist without play space. Like, it needs to be, you know, yeah. if, 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 only, if only because of magic and because of the, the impact the magic had on the industry and the fact that that's so, that was so event and tournament driven, um, 
it's such a large portion of your of your business was coming from those collectible games and the tournaments that were associated with those games, then you weren't going to survive without play space. And then as, with the rise of board games and everything else, like it needs to be an experience and not just I'm going to buy something. So yeah. basically, all these changes happen in response to the internet. One way that was part of it. Yeah, the growing so, yeah. industry. Yeah, yeah, it's the internet and and the the um, think, the event driven. Yeah, I mean, I think you have some phases, right? There was historical hobby gaming, then CCGs and the internet came kind of at the same time, Similar sure, time. sure, right? Yeah. Which changed the dynamic of retail completely, right? And then now I think we've transitioned past the CCG boom. And now I think we're in that experiential retail phase right, right. where if your store is not very nice and you know well lit and clean and has great displays and gives people a chance to interact with product and have conversations with pleasant staff, who know their stuff, sure. right? I mean, I think that those giant event centers where you've got, you know, 200 seats and nothing else to offer, I think those are also going to fade now that we're more into the experiential retail setting, right? Yep. I think when I had when I added 60 spaces to my retail space in 2001 when we moved, like tables and chairs, tables and chairs, right? It was huge. Yeah. Like that was a massive play space. And then we entered into a realm where Play spaces got insane, but that's all stores had. Yeah. Right during the CCG boom, they were just warehouses, warehouses with right. store. Like with a counter. Yeah, right, <laughs> with a little counter, right? And I think those places are now fading, and we're going into that experiential retail where you've yeah. got to have a really nice, vibrant retail experience to go with some event space. So the thesis, it seems like, and maybe I feel like Travis was about to jump in. Do you have something to add to that? So if you look at the way that our retail stores are set up, and Paul had a move, they did a move. Five years ago, six yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, 2013, I moved. Yeah, 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 and I built my space from scratch. At the time yeah. that Steve opened with Jeff, they were monstrous for a oh, yeah. game store. 3,000 or 3,500 yeah. square feet was just insane, and everybody was like 1,200 or year. It was like kind of an afterthought in a bookstore or something sure. like that, you yeah. know? Um, and then Paul's store is kind of right in the middle of both of our sizes, and our store was big, was bigger before, but a lot of it is, has to do with just the retail pricing model that I'm dealing with in Rochester versus what he has in Portland versus Baltimore. <coughs> um, but yeah, if you look at it now, it's not just addressing, okay, I've got to, I've got to offer something that's nicer than the people in town. It's that we're in an age where literally anybody can pull up their cell phone and get something in, in two hours to two days for less than what I can sell it on my shelf. Well, what's the reason why anybody would want to shop in a location where the only thing I'm offering is a guy behind the counter and boxes on the shelf. So I'll get the, instant gratification people. Um, we're at a spot where there's a bunch of white hot unobtainium products that come out during the year. Sure. So we'll get the people that are in that are at loss or they didn't pre-order on time. But what else do I have to provide to a consumer? Consumers have forced us to be better. Um, so you've got to be good at events. You've got to be good at product selection. You've got to be good at mix. You have to have intelligent staff. Um, there's just a lot that you've had to bring to the table. And if, if you kind of coasted on the magic dollar for a lot of years and you haven't built a bigger, more efficient machine. That dollar's harder and harder to fight now. Wizards has entered the, the digital space with their new Magic Arena, so all of a sudden there's a lot of customers that are just sitting home and playing the game now as opposed to having to go to a shop and stuff. And if you don't have a good shop for them to go to, what's their motivation? They can just sit home in the comfort of their, you know, they don't have to put pants on during the day and they can play Magic all day. <laughs> sure, you know? why so, not? So you gotta bring something that a customer's gonna wanna want. And you, I think each of us solves the how do you get around the fact that everything's cheaper online in different unique ways? We talk about demo tables and things like that. All of us have a used board game section, mm -hmm. which means that we can compete on price and our selection actually gets a little bit better too, so. And do you think, um, you know, if you're, if we're considering maybe this the era of a, a experiential retail for tabletop, right? Uh, that leads to a lot of questions for me, which is number one, um, offering this experience to customers, right? Because you could have, free demos available for every game that imaginable, right? You could have it stock all the games in the world. You could have a 50,000 square foot space. But in one way or another, and I mean, I, I, I get the sense that uh, the three of you are all successful retailers. Um, and it's in a sustainable way. I feel like a lot of people get into retail and kind of like, how little are you willing to make for how long? Mm -hmm. Sure. We see yeah. it a lot. Uh, yep. So, you know, my question is, uh, obviously you guys are, doing it well but the the question becomes is an experiential version of this industry uh sustainable like is it is it 
can it be replicated enough that because there's I don't know three four thousand stores in the U.S. right, right. yeah um, and and I don't think three or four thousand stores are focused on the experience at this point right um, and so what does that look like like is it is it reasonable to expect a couple thousand of those stores to to make this leap into a, a different way of doing it and and for a couple thousand to go away yeah probably is that your expectation yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so I think yeah. so because it's much harder than just putting stuff on a shelf. Like it was in the 90s. Yeah, early 90s. Right. Right. I mean, well, so, so you have to work harder and you have to be good at many different things. You have to be really good at curating your inventory and selecting the right products and forming partnerships with the right publishers that will support you in unique ways that allow you to offer cool events to your clientele, right? And sure. make sure that it's worth spending all the time and the effort on the demo tables and training your staff and you know, showing people how to play these games. Because if it's not worth it, the model breaks down. Right? Well, and there's also, I mean, there's, you know, no disrespect toward these people, but there's, there's very much traditionally been a kind of game store um, out there where it was pretty much like a person opened a shop because they wanted to work in a game store and they have no desire for continued growing success. Yeah. They're just happy to pay their bills and live their life and work in a game store. Which is which is fine, but but the the you know unless you make those those leaps to to something greater, I don't know that you're going to survive the coming changes. Do you yeah. think? Because I mean, you know, one thing you said earlier was that a lot of stores still feel too much like a boys' club, sure, right? And they're all and I think I saw this a lot, right? Even as someone involved in the industry from a young age and wanting to play in tournaments, I got turned off of a lot of stores because the only thing they did were big magic events. Yes. And if you weren't doing that, they didn't care and they kicked you out. The right? perception still exists even when that's not necessarily the case. So right? you, you oh, said yeah. that it was fine though. So I'm curious if you think that those hundreds or thousands of stores that operate like that actually had a negative impact on the growth and just view of the industry, not not to like hammer on them, but no, like, no, it's, is it's that great, something you're having question. to fight as a store? So, I, I think always, yeah. always, so, always. I've had more than once, I've had like a mom of a family come into my store yeah, we all and make the like comment that. of, oh, wow, this is really nice. And, you know, it's like, oh. Like they're shocked by it. You know, yeah. they're shocked by it. Just yeah. come to get some Pokemon cards. And, you, and, and, you, and when you engage with them and you speak with them a little bit, you'll often get a story of, oh, well, I took my kids to some place five years ago. And I vowed never to set foot in yeah. that place, or again. even that other place down the road. Right? You just assume, assume there because you're assumed. carrying the perceptions of all those stories. Yes. Yep. So the perceptions. So, so think about it in a yeah. broader spectrum, though, right? So if we walk into a, a, a retail store in a mall, there's a certain expectation of what the aesthetics can look like. Yeah. If we walk into a restaurant that's a chain restaurant, there's a certain expectation of what the aesthetics going to be. I'm talking about fast casual and higher right. up, right? Yeah. I'm not talking about fast food. Like yeah. we know that's kind of a crapshoot. Um, but in general, the consumer is going to sort out the winners from the losers at the end of the day. I can scream and holler and beat a drum and say it's unfair what online can do and it's unfair what Amazon is doing. And I can't believe that all these publishers are selling direct and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, none of those people really owe me anything. Like I, I'm, I'm at a situation where we have the best product we've ever been able to sell. And that continues to happen every single year. The sorting is a lot more complex and more complicated than it was when we all started out because there's just that number of title, but there's a lot of opportunity too. So what happens is customers lean on us for our expertise with curation. The reason why we're at shows like this is so that we can get you know, in-person looks at these games to be able to make that curation <coughs> process. So all of us travel extensively throughout the year to make sure that we're on top of our game when it comes to those products. So will that push some people out? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I, there's not a lot of stores, I think, that are opening up that start with the end game in mind. If they started with, this is how much I'd like to make, it, then they would get to the point where they're like, oh, well, in order to make that much, I need to carry this much inventory because it's impossible yeah. for me to make that much on this much yeah. inventory, which is what I can afford. Well, and, and I have to sell, into it, I have to sell into an inventory it. at a profit. Yeah, have to sell the <laughs> Not a lot, right? <laughs> and this, this much, I've got to turn it 15 times. It's just untenable how, what the expectation is. Mm -hmm. and part of the problem is just you can start a game store for a couple thousand dollars. I wouldn't recommend it, but there's people across the country. That every week it'll happen. Yeah. I, I, every week. So to a degree, it'll, it'll sort out the good from the bad. And hopefully the net result is the consumer experience is better. And as some of that stuff, kind of the low end of it washes away a little bit, then when they're walking into a game store, the expectation is higher. Perception goes yeah, up. Yeah, perception goes up. And, and those of us that survive, there's a reason why we're still around. Yeah. And doing 
perceivably well. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Now, the thing about that, and that's what I mean by sustainability, is like even doing it well, like all of you seem to be doing, um, do you think that the quality of the experience you're offering can withstand like the next 10 to 20 years? Is, is that your expectation? I, I assume that is, but I, I'd be curious if, if you're looking at it and saying, if I keep making my experience better, mm-hmm. no matter how cheap it gets online or how direct you can buy it from a publisher or how much easier it is or, or whatever the case may be, I think this will always be the superior method. I, I think there will always be a desire for people to come to a place, hang out, and have a good time. Sure. I mean, ultimately, ultimately like the things that we sell are social things. Yeah. Right? Like, like it's baked into what they are, like hanging out with other people, mm-hmm. you know? And I think part of, you know, part of that sort of feeds into our models as far as feeling like you're part of the community. I mean, I've, so <clears throat> what's interesting, right, is, is when I talk about my regular customers, so many people assume that my regular customers are people that participate in events regularly. I have plenty of regular customers that never set foot in my game room. Some of my biggest vendors never set foot in my game room, but they still feel like they're part of my community. Yeah. Sure. Because they come in and they carry, they have conversations with the staff and they talk about what it is that they're currently playing and they, and they, they share experiences and share the things that they're, they're passionate about. Um, and I think that, I don't think that desire will ever go away. Yeah. The vast majority of my customers pr- participate in one or less events a month. The, the thing is, everything that we're doing is not digital, right? So, even as good as the people are about bringing digital content, like you guys do a fantastic job introducing people to, to games and stuff. And actually, you know, we use your videos to train the staff and stuff because they're just that high quality. Like we want to be in the physical space, the quality that you guys are in the digital space, right? So the expectation of what your customers look at when they see your content, we want to be able to deliver that in a physical capacity. And I think regardless of what the numbers actually play out versus online sales versus physical sales, there's an amount of introduction that we're always going to have the opportunity to do to new customers that are looking to get involved in the stuff that we sell that the digital, you just, you can't touch that thing on the screen, right? It's, it's different when you have a physical miniature in front of you and somebody's doing a paint demo or somebody's bringing you through your first role-playing session or somebody's actually spending the time to go through the, the different questions that you have with regard to whatever the instructions were and you got yeah. lost because the translation wasn't great. So we'll always have that opportunity, and it, it's funny. For as long as we've been in business, I could go to the grocery store across the street, <coughs> survey the first 100 people that walk in. And we're big. And, and, and if 20 out of 100 knew we existed, I'd be thrilled about it. But yeah. they probably don't, which means there's massive opportunity. I mean, yeah. when I started to get into this stuff back in the 80s, Geeks weren't nearly as mainstream as what we are now, right? Like sure. nerds, are, like gamers. Like nerd stuff culture is pop culture is, right it's now. It's pop culture, yeah. right? Yeah. Like we yeah. have we have the world looking at us now in ways that they've never seen before. So the opportunity to be able to harvest those people and bring them in and show them what we have for our wares, we're we're, we're at an advantage position now. I mean, granted, the secondary sales a lot of times and stuff after we've kind of shown the customer the world and they move over from first time or two, somebody who's more of a hobbyist, then we start losing out because they'll look at their budget and go, wow, I'm spending a lot of money on board games or card games or something like that. I need to save a little bit. But that goes back to how are we, how are we as retailers addressing that challenge? Mm -hmm. Because we know it exists. It's like stores that are concerned about let's not train the customer for the sale. Okay. I'm going to be the only retail store in the country that doesn't ever run a sale because if I walk outside of my door, even the Indian grocery has sales going on. You know? like, <laughs> sure. I, this isn't the new so, thing. I know? feel like, I mean, this is something we talk about a lot in the cast, which is you're saying, all of you, and I think we, we've approached it this way as well, is that you are offering incredible value outside of just getting the physical good, right? Because I, I can go on Amazon. I can go to the publisher website. I can oh, yeah. go to online sites. I can go to my own website and, and buy things online, right? But you're doing all these things that are you know, effectively services that you're offering the customer above and beyond. You let them see the game, you demo it, you'll teach it to them, you'll talk to them, you're giving them space to play, you're giving them a community to be a part of. Um, and so right now, you know, the model as it's been forever is that um, you know, essentially a publisher sells products to a distributor, which you buy from, or sometimes you buy from a publisher directly, yeah. but they give you a discount in exchange for the work you are doing to build their communities and sell their games, right? 
And that's why they're giving you a discount, not because they like you, but just right. for those reasons, right? Yeah. Um, and so right now it feels like back in the 90s, the case was, you know, stocking my product and having my inventory be across thousands of stores and all that kind of stuff. Huge value, even showing people that here's a product that exists to buy, huge value. Um, but it seems like more and more is being asked of the services you're providing. And the only way you're, you're kind of pulling value out of that as a retailer, right? The way you're making revenue to sustain this model is by selling these products. Do you think there's a world where there's a way of, uh, you know, essentially charging for the services and not for the seller product? And what so we, that look we like? all three of us do that yeah. to some degree with right. our events. Um, whether we don't run, none of us run exclusively tournament events. We Correct. have welcome to events. We have yeah. events that are introductory things. Yeah. We have come in and check out this thing. We have specific specific publisher focused stuff yeah sometimes we bring in local designers like there's a number of different things and for the most part all of those have a fee associated with them yeah now are we making a killing on that fee no but it does pay to have the big space to have this large staff to have the education yeah. and it gets over that stuff it's not just the airplane seat model where it's like well if we don't sell that seat yeah. we can give it away like yeah. it, you know we all have different ways that we address that already. So event centric, for sure, without yeah. a doubt. Um, I think it's but it's a, it's the problem is just like other things where our peers will leverage cost as their primary driver for us, for a customer to come in. They also give events away for free too. Correct. Now some of the spaces you'd need to because they're that bad that nobody would come in otherwise. <laughs> sure. But it, it, it's a scalable thing. Yeah. You know, each of us have different stuff. Well, and I think that there are publishers that are beginning to realize that's where I was going to go, yeah. the value of what a, a better retail store a can offer. A good retailer is right, right? right. And so I think that we're starting to see more partnerships out of publishers where they realize that our demo table has value. The fact that we train our entire staff of 10 to 15 people has value. To teach value. their game. To teach right. their game has value. The fact that we're willing to run a publisher focused game night where we teach four or five of their games to you know maybe it's only 30 people sure but those 30 people then go out and evangelize that publisher's sure. product well and right? if you have 2000 retail stores teaching exactly people, right. right so Very i think quickly that, you get to it so publishers have started to realize that there is true value in what we do not all of them but some of them <laughs> sure. and some of them are willing to work with us in ways that they have not in the past and do you to help us? I mean, so like you've seen publishers starting a handful of trends, right? Publishers are kickstarting games, mm -hmm. right? Selling direct to consumer. They're pre selling games on their own website, direct to consumer. They're offering incentives for people to pre order from them instead of through the thing, right? Yeah. Um, I've also heard, uh, we, we don't sell Wizards. Uh, we, I guess we sell Transformers. We haven't sold Magic. Okay. We, we haven't done that. So, but I've heard through the, the rumblings of the industry that, you know, Wizards is working on this like big direct to consumer play. I don't know what that means. It's just what I've been hearing on, on the internet, right? The shadows of the internet. Uh, so it seems like, uh, just reading the tea leaves, right? Wizards is a huge publisher, I think, for a lot of retail stores. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like as a retailer, that kind of rumor would be interesting or dis disconcerting a little bit. In so terms we've of all like, made a lot of money not being scared of the rumors that we've heard about the Sure, industry. that's great. <laughs> right. uh, but you know, like, uh, if you, if you kind of advance this five or ten years mm -hmm. it's like do, do, i get it it's like a, a retailer that's a retailer a publisher that kickstarts a game direct to consumers it's like they're not the distributor's not getting the cut the retailer's not getting the cut they're going straight it's like if they get to charge full price that's way more money right so they need to sell way less units that kind yeah, of a thing correct. so especially i think the bigger publishers who might have enough volume to make that like notable um but like is there a world where like Publishers recognize the value you're adding. And like right now, they're rewarding that value potentially through partnerships and inventory and discounts on that inventory. Um, are those necessarily connected? So, or like, do you, is that how you think publishers are going to keep valuing you? So I think this year, more than any other year previously, we, and I mean the three of us, have been approached by publishers to talk about specifically doing next level stuff and looking at us in a way, in other retailers around the country, in the way that um, they sort of look at their influencers that are online. They understand there are certain retailers that have different metrics that play outside of the realm of average um, where there's a value for them to have their products on our shelf. Mm -hmm. So the top, top end 
they may not be uh, willing to give or to do as much as maybe the, the middle top does. But what will happen in terms is, of like size of publisher? Yeah, is that what you're referencing? It, it, what will happen is if they don't plan that space and they don't allow excellence to flourish, the other publishers will get more attention. Sure. And the reality of it is we have operations enough where if we want to sell a certain number of a, of a game, regardless of what the game is, we have the machines built to be able to do that, to really move that needle. Well, let's say there's another 50 stores in the country that do the same thing. Okay. There's value to a publisher to say, hey, you know what? We're going to do something a little bit extra, or your shelf space really matters to us. What can we do as far as yeah. working with you to make that partnership even stronger? So it's almost like, let's, let's pretend there's a world where the big publishers, the big, you know, the 80% of the revenue that's generated in retail, they all say, we don't believe in the retail model, right? We're done with this. We're going to sell direct to the consumer. And that happens. Yeah. You're basically saying the, that the machine itself has incredible value. The, the distributor to retailer, three-tier system, and all the retailers, particularly the retailers. Well, I don't know if we agree with the two-tier uh, model. So, but at least good. the retailers offer enough value in the experiences you're offering and the onboarding you're doing for and building yeah. communities and everything you're doing, right? That even if the big publishers went away and they did their own thing, mm -hmm. that the, the medium or smaller publishers would then have an enormous opportunity sure. yes. to say, okay, let's see if the system actually does work. And they, they're not direct to consumer. They're not kickstarting. They're yeah. giving it straight to you with a good discount. You, this is the one place you can get it is at these incredible retailers. So one thing that really makes that work in the current market, as opposed to even if you go back five or 10 <laughs> years, which would have been of, if the big publishers had pulled away 10 years ago, the hobby gaming industry would have been in dire straits. Because oh, it would have collapsed. 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 They were, they were yeah. too however, much of the, of the however at this point, there are so many creative designers and small companies right. and mid-sized companies making so much great content that if the big guys went away, my store would still be filled with awesome product. So yeah. I think that their ability to disappear and ruin the industry has been mitigated a lot by the fact that there's so many young, hungry, cool publishers coming up that have great stuff. Well, and so I mean, so so much of the experience in our stores is about discovery, right? Mm -hmm. Because because more and more, you know, the 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 process of putting products into our store isn't just about buying and stocking; it's about curation. Mm -hmm. It's about you know deciding which games to carry, and sometimes that means not carrying Game X from publisher big publisher Y or whatever. Yeah. But but a, but a, a really important part of it is bringing in all this little weird stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like stuff that I can't get through distribution or that like, oh, the guy down the street made, or maybe maybe somebody that I saw at a convention that's willing to sell wholesale to me direct, yeah, sure. you know? So so I always point to RPGs as, as the, the perfect example for this, right? So many stores only carry Dungeon Dragons and maybe Pathfinder and Star Wars and whatever, Shadowrun. The minute you open up to kind of another level where you've got another eight or 10 or 12 titles is the point at which you start being recognized as a role-playing game store. If somebody who who mm -hmm. only plays D&D &D comes into it comes into a store like the like the first example, they'll be fine. But if somebody who's kind of a browser of lots of different RPGs yeah. comes in and all they see is D and D Pathfinder, they're not going to feel like I'm there to service them. But the minute I I, I you know dive into some of this in some of this medium sized stuff, you know I suddenly feel like I care about them and they feel like oh this person gets it. But then once I start layering in the really weird stuff, <laughs> like the weird little indie thing, like yeah. oh here's a little thing that's in a box that's this big and this thing comes with a funky tassel or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the strange, well, it's, sure. almost, like, it's yeah. almost like the old indie record store, right? Like, yeah. like it's the import section that you get excited mm -hmm. about, you know? And wow. And yeah. then not only excited about, it because I can go to the person there and say, tell me about these. Yeah. Right. And you would be able to, cause you're just looking through vinyls. It's like, okay, there's a cool cover. Right. Yeah. But like being able to say, oh, this is a cool, we got this from China. Yeah. Like, well, or there's, there's, there's been titles, there's yeah. been titles that the three of us have sold in our store for periods of time where in the country, yeah, we're the only brick and mortar Literally stores the only that three stores are selling. Yeah. They're yeah. selling that direct on their website or, and maybe they have an Amazon sure. affiliation. But other than but that, it's like the three of the us. Only ones are, and it's not because they wouldn't sell it to anybody else or we're anything over the top special. We just ask the question, hey man, you love your stuff. Can you yep. send can us we, a couple can pieces? We get it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes, Very of cool. course, nobody's asked. 
Yeah, you're Perfect. the first one that's asked. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I want. I mean, yeah. it, it, yeah. it can be a detriment at times because we'll get a cool game in and we'll sell the crap out of it, and then they'll go to distribution and say, "Hey, these guys sold the crap out of this game." You this really, wow. Well, okay. Yeah. And yeah. now we know our party's over. But yeah. We made yeah. Good. I mean, we yeah. still sell a few, but now that's no longer yeah. one of those special. No, games. it's not yeah. cool. Which is, the next which is, but I mean, you know what? That's okay. I think the big deal there, right, is that if, if you have a board game audience that's buying those games from an RPG audience, same mm-hmm. thing. If they come to you because you are that person that finds that game first, yes, like right. they want to find that game first just as much as you want. Oh, to find that. Well, exactly. Right? And at some point, and at some point, it's just about legitimacy, right? It's sort of like the the, 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 the there's a there's a moment when, and, I, and I've, I've seen it so many times, you can almost see it in the eyes of the customer, right? When they realize that your finger is still on the pulse, yes, that they had this thing. Oh, I didn't think that was going to stores. No, it, it doesn't go to stores, but we've got, got it. We've got it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> we've got it. You know, and then the second, you know, and like maybe maybe it's the second time you do that, and they recognize it. And they're like, "You've got that other thing that I didn't think was going to stores." Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe I'll just start coming here all the time. You know, yeah, I mean? yeah, like maybe it, I you're doing all the work. Yeah, all the yeah. We yeah. talk about losing the the big guys or potentially them going direct. A lot of the big guys already go direct now. Yep. You know? Yeah. And then and then when somebody says that or they say, "Okay, we're going to erase the top however many stores or however many companies," I would say, "To what end?" Like. What would their benefit be to, right. to give serve to their competitors at that level? Like, there's no way the direct market can be that much of a win for them unless they're selling exclusive, really cool things. Still, it's probably a drop in the bucket compared to the retail equity they get from having it available at brick and mortar. And so, you think in the long run? I'm good. I had a lot of asking these questions. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, That'd be the future. Yeah, you know, even I think I think specifically just because Wizards has is, is been huge forever, yeah. right? It's yeah. like if they decided to sell Magic direct. Only yeah. and not through distribution, sure, um, or not through retail, not through retail, not yeah, through retail, retail. not through retail yeah. specifically. Okay. Uh, that you know, essentially, what you're saying is that that's really not that relevant. Because like, uh, because it's more relevant to my store than both of theirs. Yeah, it would, it like would suck, a very but we'd be fine. Customers yeah, like it, it would give, if they just walked away from retailers, yes. it would give other publishers such a tremendous opportunity Correct. Oh, for to sure. leverage oh, yeah. their system yes. uh, that it's really well, just- It's already in place. We're, we're seeing that now to a degree. I mean, they've made some changes on their pricing and their, their model and their organized plan, things like that. So there's been more efficient models for us to pursue yeah. with other publishers because yep. our time is- got better value going with other people that are more willing to to look at pricing and sure. different things yeah. like that. You know, it comes down to yeah. what's our time worth a lot and what are we getting paid for that time? You know, hopefully the most that we possibly can, you yeah. know, so. Yeah, if Wizards took away Magic and D&D from retail, a whole lot of stores would be in a whole lot of trouble. Yeah, you're right. But the, best, our time. the best stores in the country would, figure it would out. in all likelihood thrive. Sure. Because there'd be a little turbulence. There would be some turbulence. Think about it. How long have you guys been around? You haven't had a magic back in your store. 13 years. Yeah. Okay. So you do okay. So, you don't need magic. So right? you do okay. You got these fancy cameras and yeah, all these great guys working for you. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of yeah. Views. I mean, yeah, it's true. But I also feel like it's totally, I'm, I'm not saying I don't believe the same thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. But also, like, there was a good period of time where, like, every customer that walked in thought we were crazy. Oh, oh for sure. I thought you guys were crazy when I saw yeah. it. Mean, and yeah, we thoughts. we thought we were a little crazy. Yeah. Right? That's so we're just willing to do it. But uh, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, I, I get a sense that there's a lot of changes in the space that are, and I, I you can tell there's these publishers that are kind of looking and tweaking and moving yeah. around, whether it's mm-hmm. Kickstarter or Direct or Retail, or what's it really worth? Or digital, same okay. thing. Um, and retailers, all, there's also retailers that are experimenting, I think, like like you guys. So I'd be curious to know. Just kind of knowing where we're at and your perspective here, when you're looking out at the future of the next three to five years, uh, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for retailers in that three to five year window? Um, Because, you know, if if I had been answering this question in 94, 95, it's like collectible games. It's like this is a tremendous opportunity and like it's going to change the infrastructure. You you wouldn't know this in 94 necessarily. The infrastructure of the industry uh, you know, events, event space, play space, tournaments, collectible games, singles, how to do all that. Like, there's a t- ton of opportunity. So, uh, I don't know, do you, do you have anything on your radar that's the next three to five uh, without revealing too many of your trade secrets? <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> They're all just smiling. Yeah. You don't have to answer it. I can do another question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of what we've talked about, right? That experiential thing taken to the next level, I think, is probably the best answer. So just dive further into that. Yeah, and I think that in all likelihood, a little bit of culling at the retail level from the, the people who are sure. the 
older model that really isn't working. I think that well, they're not uh, adapting. Either. They're not adapting. Yeah. Those stores that aren't willing to adapt now, I think, are going to pay the price. Sure. I don't think that that's necessarily awful for the industry or yeah, the consumer, right? really, or the consumer, yeah, right? right? And, and even if, let's say, all the three or 4,000 stores in the U.S., and I think that's a rough number. I don't even know yeah. where I got that. That's just it's about, it's, that's the number we said, it's we're it's network said something about 6,000. I don't know if that's in that shoe or right? whatever. Yeah, so, but there's guys with magic stores in the back of and the like, yeah, yeah, stores yeah, all yeah, over the place. So, you know, if the other thing, and this is what this is my take on it, because I, I don't I don't view it as a zero-sum game, and I, I never yeah. have, right? Where it's like, I don't I don't feel like for Covenant to be successful, the three of you need to fail. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, well, we don't think yeah. that about it. <laughs> yeah. I hope you guys don't feel that way either. No. Uh, but the, you know, just the, the reality of if every store in the country, this is, the, I would love for this to happen. If every store in the country realized this change yeah. and made it, uh, because like you were saying earlier, where there's 100 people at the grocery store across the street, and only 20 might know your store even exists. 20 is the dream. The dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's that comment's underpinned by the idea that we know games could be for anybody. Oh, Every, so. Everybody could be involved in this community, and the, the world would probably be a better place if that were the case, right? 100%. And so, you know, that's kind of what I was, when I was asking you some questions earlier about their impact on the industry. It's the same thing where it's like, if all the stores actually started focusing on that yeah. and actually improved in that area, um, not only do I think we have more great games to sell than ever, which is great. I think the publishers are doing a really good job of innovating and pushing forward. Oh, yeah. Um, but I think we would see massive growth in the industry, and it would be good for everybody involved. Um, yeah. In the same way that like, if a thousand of those stores that aren't so good went away, yeah. that would at least stop that negative perception, and, and those customers would inevitably end up at stores that are, are doing yeah. more work and such. Um, so do you guys kind of agree that doubling down on the experiential element is the big opportunity that's available at retailers right now? It is. It's just the hardest thing a lot of times. And, and we spent a number of years doing seminars mm -hmm. on why demo tables are important. And we got kicked back, pushed back from a lot of people about For the reason why they can't or the reason why it's not tenable in their store or they don't have the space or they don't have the staff or they don't have the time or there's better things for the staff to do than demo a game to a customer. I can't imagine yeah, I can't. making that statement. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but we've we certainly I love seeing all your faces on that. It's just like... <laughs> we've certainly heard it we, before. We spent four or five years giving these seminars yeah. to other retailers yep. at Gamma, all the There's not like open house houses. Maybe. And some percentage of people got it, yep. and a lot of people were very resistant. Yeah. Change is hard. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, well, yeah. and there's a terror of change. So there's there's a twofold thing you run into. There's the boredom of what's currently active and the grumblings that go on about, well, there's been nothing new. And then there's the there's the other side of that where as soon as something new is announced, they don't know what to do. But we were big on the Keyforge <laughs> train very, very early on. Yeah, we ordered a lot Instantly. of Keyforge. We were at the Gen Con seminar. We saw it. It was a hit. We recognized it. We played the game. All of us did very, very, very well with Keyforge. But the number of retailers that were day two going, I can't believe I can't get a hold of this. And we beat that drum as loud as possible. Because yeah. like you said, we don't think that the rest of the stores in the country need to fail for, for us to succeed at all. We actually want there to be successful stores and stuff. Yeah. It benefited us to tell the rest of the world this Keyforge thing is going to be awesome because it's a game that's event centric. Yes, and we need other stores to capture that their communities to host bigger regional events. With a two hundred seat store, I want to be able to pack that with Keyforge players. Well, if we run into what we ran into with Destiny, where there was such a limited product and it felt exactly the same as that game, and I said that was going to happen, and it happened, um, you get into the situation where a game sputters out because. It's it's catastrophic success. Yeah. But as far as trying to get somebody to make that turn, they can come up with the same excuses and the same problems that the customers have. Mm -hmm. Well, there's only so much we can do on that and to try to educate people or try to help them make those improvements. They have to make that decision themselves. And some people can and some people can't. Yeah. And we, yeah. We, an interesting point for us is that there's a lot of little indie games that the three of us will talk about and we'll bring in. And maybe we don't, you know, we're not going to espouse those to the world. Right, but something like Keyforge, the three of us were beating that Keyforge drum so hard from day one is because it, we knew that that's not a game that we can succeed with in isolation. Sure. So it's essentially you need right. a very strong community, nation. I need the world playing that game for it to be if successful. If it's going you. to be successful long term, right? So, that's how Magic worked. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, so you mentioned Keyforge and that it being not available on Destiny, the same thing. Um, and it almost seems like you're saying that. Retailers not getting on board early enough 
is causing the issue? Do you, do you think that the root of that problem is the retailer? So it depends on which, which angle you want to yeah. try to address this. Yeah. Some of it breaks down from the three-tier system because a lot of publishers go to distribution with a game or an idea or a pitch or something like that. We just saw this recently with Wingspan, although there's a whole bunch of... Yeah, it's complicated. That's a yeah. very long but conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but And sometimes the buyers there, because they're seeing so many things, they just can't identify something that's that's a hit right away or they, they're okay, but... It's hard to predict. A, a, a distribution buyer never gets, never gets fired for an empty warehouse. <laughs> a full warehouse, it's different, you know? Yeah. So them, you know, putting forth the risk and taking on that risk a lot of times will end up impacting us. I mean, we make money off their lack, their risk aversion, actually, because we'll buy and corner a market in our area yeah. based on those games we identify that are successful. Um, so it's not... Well, you make money in the short term. Yes. But if a game... But if a game fizzles out because of that, then yeah. it's no I mean, board games is different, but sure, a collectible right. game, something yeah. like, like that. If, like if you were sitting on a couple hundred copies of Wingspan when it came out, you're doing pretty good. Oh, you're doing great. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. Nobody yeah. got those. Nobody, right. Nobody got that. <laughs> Shrug. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a more problem with the whole system. Yeah. It's Retailers a, it's not a, identifying it's early. It's a systemic yet. problem. Um, There's a problem from top to bottom. Retailers yeah. do not pre-order adequately. Distribution has the worst business model of all of us. Their profit margins are horrible. It's the worst. And they're terrified to get stuck with extra product yep. because a little bit of extra product ruins but all of their potential ability to pay their workforce and make any money at all. I don't envy their position in this. It's So I think... Um, and they have the hardest job. And they course. can't pick because they don't know how to pick because there's too many products and they can't afford to say no to all of their partners. Sure. Whereas we can tell nine out of 10 games from one of the publishers that you're not coming to my store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean... But they, can't, they, they don't have that. Right? Yeah, if they yeah. want to be a line and they want to sell their line, they have to take the good with the bad. And there's a lot of that out there. There's a lot of... I shouldn't say There's that. a lot of... Okay. There's a lot of... There, well, there's a lot of mediocre. games that don't sell. There's a lot of games. Yeah. yeah. There's it's, a lot of games that are very good that don't sell very well currently that 10 years ago would, would have, have been, been the best runaway bestsellers. Yeah. 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 The quality of the, is much higher. Okay. So I, I know you guys have a time, time limit here. So I want to get to this, uh, this thing. I know... I know very little about what happened, but I know I saw Travis, you posted on Facebook that uh, the three of you, I think, purchased Free RPG Day. Yes, um, so I would like to know what is Free RPG Day and why in the world did you buy it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this to Paul. Oh, yeah, we're going okay. to let Paul run. All right. so, um, so Free RPG Day is, is, um, is an event that happens every June. Um, it's not dissimilar. In fact, I'm slightly modeled on free comic book day okay. where the idea is that customers come into a store that's participating and there will be free exclusive content for a variety of role playing games that are available that day. And are these more like D and D mainstream or like some of the weirder ones you've been talking All about? All over the place. Cool. Yeah. Um, so sometimes very large publisher involved. Some, more often than not, it's, it's a lot of sort of mid-sized publishers, um, with some, 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 some nice flavor sort of thrown in there. A lot of them are quick starts with a, with an exclusive adventure. Um, but at the very least, it is it is exclusive content so that you can get this unique thing that you can't get anywhere else, um, at least at least for a while. And so, how's that work? A retailer buys a thing from retailer you. Retailer buys a kit. Yeah, retailer retailer buys a kit or multiple copies of said kit, and it has, you know, uh, uh, defined quantities um, depending on the, the publisher level of involvement of how many of these things you're going to put out. And then the goal for the retailer is to give those away. Yes, it is to get customers in their store. Right. So there are very few. Um, there are very few holidays, if you will, that are, that, are, that are there are very few national events that occur in our industry sure. that aren't directly tied to a single brand, um, uh, you know, or, or single game release or something. Um, so this is an opportunity for stores to celebrate role playing games, which is arguably the, the bedrock of why we're all here um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, it also allows stores to to say to those customers who are often, especially these days, the most overlooked of our customers, because let's be honest, it's the smallest portion of our business, sure. you know, but there are customers who only play role-playing games and they don't dabble in the other stuff that we deal with. But it is a, it is a way to, for one, say, this is your day. You know, we're not going to kick you off the tables because of magic or whatever, this, that, whatever. Um, so we're telling these customers that they're important. We're, we're highlighting these, these products and we're hopefully exposing them to new games that they might not have otherwise been exposed to. Cool. And why, why did you guys buy it? And my assumption is you're, you're very um, forward-thinking, innovative people, and you're, you're always looking to push things forward. So my, I imagine you bought it. Uh, 
and I want to know why you bought it. And then what, what are you going to do with this thing? <laughs> it, it's not going to stay the same, right? Like what's the future of free RPG? Day? Sure. So the future is better. Yeah. Like, I mean, we, we want to improve it and we want to help stores kind of climb that ladder with all the other things we've been talking about, that experiential thing, right? So can, how can we help stores make that day part of their experiential experience, right? Let's, let's bring people into the stores. Let's get them trying new games and playing things at tables. Um, I think a lot of stores traditionally have been kind of, oh, we got the thing. And well, I don't know, it's not really that big of an event for us. Sort of that's like, but, yeah. but we want to help yeah, people doing, kind of learn yeah. how to do these events. If and you just put free stuff on a table, yeah. like, no wonder it's not that exciting. So it's like, so we're hoping, you, know, you need to use yeah. that as your, as, as the, as we're the, hoping, I mean, we've got three different size stores. I mean, we all do very nice numbers, right? But our physical space are different sizes. We have a very good feel for how to utilize different size spaces, right? To kind of have events and do cool things, right? So we want to help people kind of learn how to do that, broaden the RPG experience, and help some of our publishing partners that we think are fantastic people who make really cool products that maybe don't have the recognition that something like D&D has. Sure. Because um, I think the RPGs are so cool now. There's so many RPGs that are innovative and exciting and interesting. It goes way beyond D&D. &D. Way beyond D&D. &D. So, and if we can so help bring more people company, to the table. And the company great. name is Gaming Days LLC. That gives you a little bit of a hand. That yeah, gives right? you an so, indication. I mean, so we might do more. So this was, a, this was an opportunity that came on because Paul had worked directly with the former steward of Free RPG Day, yep. the guy who created it. Um, and we've always participated at some level with it throughout the years, and it's been successful. There aren't a ton of opportunities like that that kind of come along um, with something that's got like a, it's some consistency to it, mm -hmm. right? As sure. opposed to having to create something from the foundation. So it's something where all of us looked at it and we said, you know what, we can we can do this and we can innovate it in a way and take all the suggestions that we've already had that we would do if it was our own thing, mm -hmm. plus the bevy of suggestions that our peers and our customers yeah. and some distributors have made to say, hey, this can be improved. Um, but yeah, to speak to what Paul said, I mean, it's, it's one of the few days of the calendar. Now, the reality of it is every weekend there's 40 conventions going on across mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. Well, if you took something and you were to more focus it on a specific style of game or a specific publisher, yeah. we have all these stores with these spaces. And if there's less people that are playing Magic or other things in there, the chairs and the tables are still there. Sure. So providing them with That'd different some opportunities. Mini, mini conventions rather than having to go, okay, we've got to pack up all of our stuff and go to the local VFW or wherever they're hosting the thing or the <laughs> yeah. college, and we're going to set up our table and hopefully that does more business. There's no reason why you can't do that business in the store and the space that you have. So what are the different spaces that you could get into with that? You can probably go through it. You guys cover them in your videos all the time, yeah. different opportunities and areas that we can get into. Sure. That too, so so I, I think that's really cool um, because, you know, unknowingly, uh, at least when I start asking all these questions throughout the show, it seems like your actions are, are actually very much lined up with your beliefs, uh, <laughs> which is which is good. I mean, that's it doesn't always happen. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised. Yeah. But the reason I say that is that it's obvious you guys care about tabletop games yeah. um, and their importance and their role in society. Um, and you're, you're actively, you know, if you do believe the future of retail is experiential, the idea that you start a company that offers tools for stores to do experiential things makes a lot of sense. And I'm really excited to see what you do because I think you guys are all forward thinking uh, innovators pushing things forward. And I love seeing that. Um, so where for retailers or customers looking to get info about free RPG day, where is that? Is there a website for that? FreeRPGDay.com. That's a pretty good domain to have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For that right there. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, um, the names of your stores again, really quick in case people want to look you up and the location. Rainy day games outside of Portland, Oregon. Okay. Uh, games and stuff outside of Baltimore and Glen Burnie, Maryland. Millennium games in Rochester, New York. Awesome. Well, hey, I appreciate it so much. Thank you guys for spending your time here again. I know it's super busy and you guys had to move things around to be here. Um, best of luck with everything from Free RPG Day. I can't wait to see what you do. And hopefully we're going to have you back on the, uh, the cast either at Next Gamma or future shows. Yeah. For everyone watching, thank you so much for watching and tuning or listening. Tune into the cast. Uh, we have plenty more coming from Gamma 2019, so stay tuned. And until then, keep playing.